So let's go ahead and get started. So our goal today is to talk a little bit about just like the basics of vegetable gardening, how to set up a vegetable garden, how to create a vegetable garden, um, and some of those important things we need to consider besides just planting our seeds and letting them grow. Um, so before we get kicked off again, I want to introduce myself. My name is Dr. Taylor Clem. Um, I have a background in landscape architecture and sustainable design, as well as, you know, just growing up, I've always grown and had a vegetable garden. I learned how to garden on my, at, uh, in a victory garden or remnants of a victory garden. Um, that my grandfather had up in Northern Kentucky. And that's where I learned about planting. Um, I would get to like plant new seeds, different transplants. I would uh, manage the pest. But then the best part is always when you get to go out and harvest. I always loved going out to my grandfather's harvest and we, uh, the garden and I would harvest blackberries. And we'd come inside, we'd make blackberry cobbler or we'd go out, we'd harvest the tomatoes, the green beans, the cabbage, the apples. Um, just the just the amount of produce and fruits and vegetables that you can grow in your yard is tremendous. And that's where I learned how to do a lot of my vegetable gardening is just through my grandfather and just learning from there. And then just a lot of trial and error growing up doing different gardens. So today's goal, once we're done uh, spending this time together, I want us to be able to answer these three big questions. How do I plan and design a vegetable garden? Because that's very important. The next one is what are common vegetables um, and fruits to grow in Alachua County? And then how do I manage my garden? Because the, our gardens are all going to act a little bit differently based off of what we grow, as well as the type of pests that might pop up. So I did have one question to ask to make sure um, if I can repeat any questions or comments that are made from everybody. I absolutely will do that. So when we plan and design a vegetable garden, there's three big things that we need to consider. Location, the type of garden, and also we need to start to answer where does a garden start? So when we start thinking about location, what are some of the things that you think about will be important when you're thinking about locating a garden? Go ahead and put those uh, comments in the chat box. Absolutely. So uh, the type of garden, so you know, the, the type of garden can have an impact on uh, the location of it. Uh, the amount of sun, sun versus shade. Um, wow, yeah, there's been a lot of comments talking about sun and shade. Drainage, that's very important, yeah. Uh, moisture is, I mean, we need plants. Plants need to have uh, water available to them but we need to make sure that they have really good drainage because otherwise you can bring in fungus or you can uh, end up having unintentional rot occur within your vegetables. Soil quality, yeah, exactly. So um, you all hit on some really, really good uh, considerations that we need to think about. So we're gonna talk some about some of the big key ones uh, when siting our uh, garden. So we talked about those locations and, you know, some of the things that we need to consider are like full sun. We need to have about six to eight hours of sun uh, within the garden uh, in order to make sure that, A, we're able to grow the plants that we need, but they can also produce the, the, the amount of pr produce, vegetables or fruit um, adequately that can make it worth the time and ever putting them in. We need them near water. One of the, I know uh, a lot of us mentioned in the comments and the chats that we want, um, uh, that we want to concern ourselves with drainage, but we also have to, th have to think about where do we have water available to us. Uh, consider, um, consider the time that it takes to bring in water from somewhere. Are you going to be bringing it in through a hose bib? Is there easy access with that hose? Um, you can see in the image in the bottom, that's the old extension office. And there was a hose bib located right next to where the garden was put. And uh, we ended up in adding irrigation off of that hose bib and it grew uh, significantly. Um, 
But also think about, and so we're thinking about where water is available to us. But also make sure that we're keeping um, the vegetable garden away from buildings. You don't necessarily want it right on homes or buildings. Um, as well as we need to make sure that's away from competing trees. Tree roots, um, even some trees, they uh, produce what we call allelopathic um, compounds, and they actually suppress germination of seeds. So you can have certain trees that are actually almost like a natural herbicide that can prevent your garden from growing, um, as well as making sure that you have well-drained soils. So when we're talking about sunlight, you know, we're going to have our most sun on the southern side of our homes, least sun on the northern sides of our homes. So if you have the ability to have a garden on the southern part of your house or your property, that's going to give you the best impact when it comes to optimal sunlight, just because you will have adequate sun, sun in the summer, because the sun is sitting higher in the sky, but as well in the winter or the cooler times of the year, when that in Florida, at least, that's when we're able to grow grow most of our plant material or the most diverse vegetables and fruits in our yard, um, we need to make sure that we have that sunlight available and the sun's going to be sitting lower in the sky compared to the summer. So that southern side of our building is going to be the most adequate. Um, you can do the east or west side, but the northern side is going to be a little bit tougher. Um, and that's primarily assuming that you're going to have a vegetable garden that's in shade uh, from like a building or a structure. So I just make sure that it, it's completely open. Oh, I had a question pop up. Where's a hose bib? A hose bib um, is just the, the water spigot on your home where you hook up your hose. So that's a really good question. Um, I did have another question that came through that asked about why can't everyone see the, the chat box. Um, as part of security for this, the chat only I can see. Um, so that's just a, just a security issue that we do have. So that's why I repeat a lot of the stuff in the in that chat box. Um, so, and we did have uh, one question pop up about how do we know when sweet potatoes are ready to be picked? We'll come back to that one in a, in a short period. So let's go ahead, uh, move forward with the sunlight. Uh, talking about loc locating a vegetable garden. So we do know that uh, the sunlight, optimal sunlight, is going to be very, very important. So what types of gardens do you want to do? So, you know, we mentioned drainage, soil drainage, and in some parts of Alachua County, like we experience this a lot on the eastern side of the county. Um, when you start to go out towards Melrose and Hawthorne, the water table is a little bit higher. So um, drainage can sometimes be a little bit harder because the, just that water table is so high. So traditionally we are going to see a lot of homeowners do the raised bed gardens, gardens because you can build a frame and you can put soil in that, ensure that has good drainage, and then you're not as concerned about that sandy soil or a high water table that's in the native uh, undisturbed area of your of the ground. Um, there's a traditional gardening method, and that's where you just till the soil and just uh, garden um, just like that. Sometimes it's a little bit harder to do, especially if you're new at gardening, uh, because we have to really consider more about soil amendments to make sure that we have a strong, healthy soil. But say you don't have a yard or you don't have a, a big yard where you can do a raised bed or traditional garden in the ground, container garden is really, really easy and it's a fun thing to do where in your home, just like a little patio, just get some pots uh, from a local home goods store and you can garden right in there. And like you can see in this image, tomatoes are wonderful things that you can grow in containers, but leafy greens, herbs, uh, some sweet potatoes um, or other potatoes that you can grow. Um, you can grow so much in containers and that allows you to, you know, if you live in an apartment or a townhome where you don't have that space available, you still can grow food and vegetables or herbs around your home. So when we talk about like, where do you start with a garden? Um, that's, that's one of the, I guess it's one of the biggest questions or bit, one of the biggest conversations I have with a lot of people is where do you start? It starts with the soil. Soil is the foundation. It's the absolute foundation of having a strong, happy, healthy garden in your landscapes. The soil helps regulate soil moisture availability, the amount of nutrients or food or the nutrients that can be uptaken by the plants in order to create their food. Um, 
and it just helps make sure that you have good oxygen exchange within the roots. So soil is really, really, really important consideration for us uh, when we're starting any type of garden. So whenever we think about where to start, let's start with the foundation and that's the soil. So uh, we did have one question actually came in was like, if we're selecting a certain type of garden, whether it's going to be traditional raised or container, um, what is the best for say like deer proofing or say you have animals? I prefer using raised bed vegetable gardens because you can, um, you have a little bit more flexibility on where you can lo locate those and it's easier to put uh, fences around those um, and kind of create a, design, a nice little designated garden space and those uh, fencing areas can just be uh, aesthetically can look really nice but they can also be a really good deterrence for deer but nonetheless deer are very creative um, they can find a way if they need to, but so there's other ways that we can deter uh, garden pests like deer or squirrels or raccoons from um, coming into our garden and causing some damage. It's a very good question. So soil, soil is gonna be very, very important for us to consider when uh, we're creating our garden. So when we think about soil, there's a bunch of different ways that we can build or create our own soil, especially for that vegetable garden. Um, so one of the things that's important that we always want us to do is, you know, just with traditional soil, if you just have, if you're just using the soil that's in your landscape, you know, we always recommend getting a soil test or anytime that you have a vegetable garden that you're going to start working in, we recommend a soil test. A soil test what it can do is that soil test will tell us like our pH, our soil pH, as well as some of the nutrients that are available within that soil. So soil pH, you know, we have like an ideal window of pH that we want. So 6.5 is generally, it's slightly acidic, and that's like the general, the ideal soil pH. But if we start to go too acidic or too alkaline, so too low or too high on that pH scale, our plants might not have the ability to uptake the nutrients in the soil. Um, so that soil test will allow us to know what the pH is and then we can amend the soil to help adjust to that pH a little bit. So, um, and as well as the same toil, soil test, it, it'll let you know if you need to add micronutrients like magnesium or if you need to add some more potassium. Uh, it can get and it just based off of the soil's conditions, that soil test can tell you, here's where you can go from now to help improve the likelihood of success within your garden. But say you're gonna make, um, make your own soil and you're gonna build it and put it into uh, your own vegetable garden uh, or raised bed that you create. Um, we have kind of like a general mix we refer to as Mel's mixed or Mel's mix, and it's just equal parts compost, peat moss, um, and coarse vermiculite, and just kind of mix them all together really well. Um, one of the concerns that we do have though is peat moss is not sustainably harvested, so uh, you can just do a comp. Uh, compost coarse vermiculate mixture or you can do a compost native soil and a coarse vermiculate mixture. There's a bunch of different ways that we can grow that but the Mel's mix is tried and true mixture that you can throw into a garden bed and it can be lead, help lead to a very successful garden. So um, one of the questions that we have is what is a soil? So how do we get a soils test? Reach out to our office. We have a soil test form, UF IFAS. We have a soil test on uh, campus or it's a soil test lab on campus. And uh, you can submit your soil samples to them and you'll get a, um, you'll get results back of that soil test and I as well will get a copy of the soil results so I can help interpret those with you. Um, but it's a very easy process to do. Um, reach out to me to do that soil test and I can get you those forms to do it and I can walk you through that process as well. Um, another question we had pop up was who is Mel? Mel is just a gardener, um, a famous gardener that created a book called um, uh, the, the Square Foot Gardening Guide and it's just the soil mix that he uses in that book. So um, 
So the cost to do the soil test, that was one of the questions that popped up, is $3 is just for a pH test. It's $10 to do pH as well as the nutrient testing. Um, and you can test different areas on your landscape. So when you do the soil test, um, some of the tests you can get are specifically going to look at, say you're growing blueberries. So those recommendations that you get from your soil test can be tailored for blueberries, specific turf grass species or vegetable gardens. So when you fill out that form, you can kind of write what sam that sample is for. If you, that sample that you collected, it's coming from a vegetable garden or if it's coming from your ornamental gardens, it will give you the, uh, those recommendations based off of what you're growing. And one of the great recommend, one of the a good example of that is talking about ideal pH of that like 6.5. Blueberries require very acidic uh, soil. So the recommendations are gonna change slightly based off of just that pH. So very good question. So when we want to build a garden bed, so you know how to make the soil, what you're gonna use the soil, I always encourage people to start small. Um, I had a good friend recently who lives in Denver. He and his wife, they turned their entire backyard into just a series of raised beds. And they don't even know what to do because they're, they're producing a lot of food, way more than they can consume because it's only three of them. Um, that are consuming all of it. And they have, I think like 20 different vegetable beds that are about four by 10 a piece. That's a lot, that's a lot. So um, they are giving away so much of their food and they're spending almost all their time outside working in the garden because it's just so large. Um, so I always encourage anybody, if you are uh, going to start a new garden, just start small. Start, uh, you can start with like a two by two garden. Uh, so four square feet, that has the ability to produce a lot of food. Um, you'd be very surprised. Uh, but um, other, like in these images, what we are showing, they're showing uh, three by three foot gardens or raised beds. Um, cardboard was dropped down first to help with uh, weed suppression, weed control. And then there's those three uh, by three foot, there's four three by three uh, raised beds. And usually they're gonna range between 12 and 18 inches deep. And that's primarily for some of our deep rooting vegetables. Um, a good example is uh, carrots. One time we grew a carrot in a six inch raised vegetable bed and it had a weed barrier at the bottom of it. So the carrot was an L shaped when we harvested it because it just hit the barrier and then grew out sideways. Um, so, you know, something just small like this is three by three foot uh, garden that's using a 12 to 18 inch uh, depth uh, boards. That's gonna give, that's gonna produce a lot for you. That's going to produce a lot for you. So um, wood choice is very, very important. Typically, we don't recommend treated lumber because of how it is treated. Um, and some of the materials that they use in that treatment process could be carcinogenic. Um, and we don't want that to leach within the soils. Some of our newer treated lumber uh, that you can get from the store now is safer. Um, but I still, I still wouldn't necessarily recommend that because that requires you having to know how to read all the symbols that are on that are stamped um, on the board. But then, uh, but some of them, other good ones are like cedar, black locust, redwood. They all are rot resistant, so they hold up a little bit better. In all of our vegetable gardens that we use with the Master Gardener Volunteer Program, we just use untreated pine. We just have to replace it every two, three years, depending on how it ages. Um, and that works perfectly for us. And it's easy to go in, replace them and rebuild them on a regular basis. So um, one thing that you can do is when you have your raised beds, you can always mark off square foot or square foot sections. And you can plan your garden really well by using the square foot gardening method. Uh, because we have the ability, you know, we know that plants need certain amount of space to grow. So we have recommendations where it's like based off of the amount of onions you want to plant or beets, we know how many of those can fit within one square foot and grow and be successful. So we can plan and organize our gardens based off of square foot gardening. So that's very easy. You can look up guides and resources. We have some available on how to plan for square foot gardening. 
So let's talk a little bit about our uh, seasonal fruits and vegetables that we can grow. Um, I did have some question, a question come through is what are some good fruits and vegetables to plant in the fall? So our gardens are really different, especially, you know, I, I learned how to um, grow fruits and vegetables. I learned how to garden up north. And when I moved down to Florida, it was completely different with what I learned. Um, a great example is I'm used to growing tomatoes in the middle of the summer. When I learned how to garden, I was growing tomatoes in the middle of the summer. But now, you know, the best time to, for us to plant tomatoes are going to be February, March, and April. Um, our ideal, our major time of the year in which we want to plant our, uh, or have the most diverse plants and growing in our garden is our cool season period or the cool season vegetables. Um, our warm season is a little bit more limited on what we can grow just because of our heat. So that climate has a huge impact on what we can plant and when we can plant it. So just when you look at this list that you see here, uh, what are some of the plants that you'd be interested in putting in your garden? Go ahead and uh, put that in the chat box. Watermelon, tomatoes, cucumbers, beans. Oh, what are bush beans? Good question. So beans, you know, we usually have beans that grow up on trellises, but we have some beans that like go in bush form. So, yeah. Pole beans, sweet potatoes, cucumbers, peppers. Oh, this sounds delicious. <laughs> blueberries, yeah, blueberries are not on this list. Um, and that's primarily because of with the timing that we plant them and we actually manage blueberries a little bit differently than we would at like a vegetable garden. Cantaloupe, yummy. So um, I was out at a, um, a while ago, I was out at uh, a grower and it's just like one of the best things to see is just the fields of watermelon. In Alachua County, that's one of the best things that we are one of the one of our biggest agricultural commodities in, during time of the year is our watermelon. So that's a huge agricultural commodity for us. Um, but what I'm going to do right now, actually, is I'm going to share with you in the chat box. It's a publication from UF IFAS Extension, and it is the Vegetable Gardening Guide. Uh, and in there, there is a complete calendar and schedule of different things that you can plant or grow um, throughout the year. That's an amazing resource. I give that to everybody. Everything that we talk about today, this is going to be covered within it. So, um, but anyways, one of our biggest concerns when we're talking about plant selection or what we want to grow within our garden, seasonality has a huge role in what we can pick and uh, pick and choose. Right now, uh, we're about to get within our early part of our uh, cool season vegetable gardening. So August starts to become a time where we can start to plant things for the early fall so we can start to uh, for production, etc. So um, that'll be a good resource for you to check out on, to check out. But some of the big ones that we're going to start seeing is like squash. August. Uh, so this Friday, I mean, Saturday, I guess is August 1st, you can start to plant your squash. Um, you can do some pole beans. Uh, you still have an opportunity to do uh, corn planting, but start your cucumbers. Um, but you can start to see that we start to fall out of some areas for some of our plants. One of the great examples that we grow really well in the warm season is uh, okra. Uh, as well as our sweet potatoes. So okra, March to July, that's going to be our warm season plants. They thrive in that heat. So uh, that's why you're seeing, you know, they're related to uh, like hibiscus. So what you're going to start seeing is they're flowering and producing their fruit right now. Um, and there many people are already starting to harvest them. Um, you could probably plant some transplants if you wanted to do some okra now, and they'll be a little successful, not as well as if you did in the early part of the season. Um, but another one is the sweet potatoes. So sweet potatoes, those are great. I love using sweet potatoes or potatoes. Um, they will grow them at different types of the year. But sweet potatoes, I love because um, 
because um, they are great for getting kids interested in gardening. Um, same with the potatoes. You plant them in the ground, you wait approximately uh, 90 to 120 days, um, and then you can start harvesting your sweet potatoes or your potatoes. It's hard to tell to determine when they're going to be ready um, because what's happening is all underground. But once you start seeing the sweet potatoes or those potatoes start to spread and sprawl more, then you're getting to a good harvest period. But um, sweet potatoes and potatoes, I almost call them like the gateway plants to vegetable gardening. Um, and you know we're in we're at we're outside of prime sweet potato season but when we start in the middle of the winter we're starting to get to that uh the potato planting time and i always say the best way to celebrate valentine's day is by planting potatoes because that is the typically the ideal temperature and period for us to plant um potatoes is valentine's day so that's how i always joke is valentine's day go as a good valentine's day dan, uh, date valentine's day date go plant potatoes. Um, so check out that guide, look for how that seasonality varies. But the biggest thing is our summer is gonna be the hardest time for plants and the, the cooler times of the year is gonna be the best time. In the summer, we do have some options that we call green manure, um, which are just plants that aren't gonna be necessarily be productive, but you can then till, knock them down and till them into the soil it helps build a healthier soil. So here's some of the cool season plants that we have available to us. Um, so the turnips, collards, strawberries, the potatoes, um, onions, arugula. This is where you're gonna do, get a lot of your leafy greens because they're not gonna get crispy and fried up by the sun. Um, carrots are wonderful to start planting because you can plant, I think about 16 of them per square foot. Um, as well as turnips, you can do 16 per square foot, but turnips um, and radishes, they have the ability to mature in like 30 days. So really, really quick. So you can plant seeds and pull out um, as quickly as you can eat them. Um, so they're, those are amazing little plants, especially if you're trying to get someone interested in gardening because you're gonna see turnaround pretty quickly uh, with some of the plants that you can pull up. But let's talk about managing the garden. So we looked briefly at how we can design and plan for the garden. Think about the sunlight, water availability, soil conditions, the soil test. Again, when you want to do soil test, reach out to me. They're really easy to do. Um, and I can help make sure that you can show you how to get those submitted. Um, but we talked about the different types of plants that you can grow, but the biggest thing has to do with seasonality, um, the, so the warm versus the cool times of year. But then, you know, you planted your garden, you designed it, you planted it. Now you got to think about management. You can't just plant your plants and walk away. Um, you need to be vigilant. You need to make sure that you're monitoring your garden regularly uh, to make sure that the plants are happy and healthy. There was one comment earlier that popped up when we were talking about tomatoes. Someone said, tomato hornworm, watch out for tomato hornworms, which is very true. Uh, if you're not careful, a tomato hornworm you won't see him and then like four days later five days later you'll have a monster like this big climbing over your tomatoes just nomming them down to the ground so you have to make sure you're monitoring your garden regularly to help make sure that the plants are happy and healthy so when we're talking about garden management one of the big things that we always think about is water how do we get water to the plants because obviously they need to have good drainage but they still need to have adequate amount of water so you can always water by hand that's a very tried and true method, um, but it does require you going out once or twice a day to make sure your plants are getting watered. Um, you can always set up a micro irrigation system on a timer and you can build that into your irrigation beds or uh, bring it into the irrigation beds and that takes a little bit more expertise and timing but it's 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 actually pretty easy to do uh, you can get kits at the uh, big box stores and home goods stores that walk you through how to set that up um, one option is using overhead sprinklers we don't recommend using that because it just wastes water and it can help actually bring in encourage fungus to grow in your plants So, um, and speaking of fungus, I'll talk a little bit about 
in a, a second, but someone did send in a question about what's the best response for fungus that develops in the garden and how to prevent it. So fungus typically prevent occurs within our gardens primarily because of excess moisture or excess water. When watering our plants, we kind of think of a balance between you need enough, but you don't want too much. And if there's too much water and say you're applying, you're irrigating at night, um, water can hang out for too long on those plants and you're not having an excess dry up. So it kind of just encourages fungus growth. So the amount of water and timing is gonna be important. We recommend irrigating in the, the morning um, sometime in the morning so the plants have the ability to uptake a lot of the moisture, you have high efficiency with that water, and the loss is very low. And any excess of water that's on the leaves, which can lead to fungus, has the ability to dry off as the day heats up. But if we water late at night or in the evening, excess of water, the plants will have plenty of water that they can uptake, but the excess of water just sits on the leaves all night and it slowly evaporates and that can encourage fungus growth. So making sure that we're applying just enough water and also make sure that we try to do it in the morning to prohibit uh, the fungus from coming in. But if you do have fungus pop up, there's different ways to treat it. Making sure that you're following best management practices is going to be important. So best management practices, watering or the irrigation, um, irrigating properly, spacing of the plants can be important too because too close together they can encourage uh, rot development so or fungus development. So the biggest thing is making sure that they can stay dry. Um, but if you do have it, there's simple copper fungicide that you can get and apply to gardens that can really help out and control fungus. That's a good question and is important to relate to, especially with talking about, as we talk about water. But moving on with managing the garden, um, I know we'll talk a little bit about fungus in a bit, but uh, that talks about the managing pests. So managing pests, what are some of the pests that you've seen in your landscape? I know earlier someone mentioned, um, someone mentioned um, a deer, but what are some of the pests that you've noticed in your landscape? Go ahead and put those in a chat box. Squirrels and birds, absolutely, yes. Mealybugs, mm-hmm. Cats, my dogs, yes, dogs. <laughs> I've had to chase my dog out of the herbs before, yeah. Birds, armadillos, yeah. Ants, ants can be very problematic. So, uh, so yeah, the, the, the types of pests that could pop up in our landscape range from small mammals, large mammals, uh, insects, um, but this is where you technically you can also put in pests, this is where you put like fungus and pathogens, disease, et cetera. But the biggest ones that we're gonna talk about uh, is like the, what's gonna be eating our leaves, what could potentially bring in disease. Um, so this is where we really talk about how do we manage our gardens safely. What is the best way that we can prevent pest damage from occurring in our landscape and limit the type of pesticides or insecticides that we need to use within the landscape? So um, we had a question come in earlier about discussing organic pesticides. So this is going to be that great point that we talk about that a little bit. But when we talk about managing pests, I look at it from a spectrum. So we, we mentioned, we call it the integrated pest management. So IPM. And we talk about IPM, we talk about a spectrum. So what's the like the first thing we do versus what's the very last thing that we can do. So the very first thing we do was we mentioned cultural. Cultural controls are making sure that like we are watering properly, we're spacing our plants properly, the soil is being uh, treated properly. If you're applying fertilizers, you're applying the appropriate amount because too much can just bring in pests, too little can bring in pests. So following those best management practices, you know, if you, if you follow these BMPs for your vegetable gardens and even for your ornamental landscape, not just vegetable gardens, but anything in your landscape, um, they, sing, they have a natural defense to pest and disease. So whenever um, pests or disease come to a tree or a plant um, 
what's typically is happening is they're attracted to a stressed plant. So when a plant is stressed, it's like they got the big like neon lights flashing over them saying like, oh, you can eat buffet. So that's bringing them in, that's attracting them all in is that plant stress. So if we follow cultural controls, the plant isn't stressed um, or has very limited stress. So you're gonna reduce the likelihood that you're gonna have pests come into your landscape and cause issues. Um, but say, you, you have the, a problem where, okay, you, have, you follow your cultural management practices, what, and it's not working, what's the next thing? So that's what we talk about mechanical controls. I always joke one of the most effective mechanical control methods for a garden is your shoe because you can squash uh, pests very easily by just stepping on them or if you have a glove you can smash them with your hand. There are little mechanical things that you can do to kind of dispose of pests manually. Um, of course you can't step on a deer or I would not recommend stepping on a bunny but those are like the the little insects and pests that will pop up within your landscape. Um, but one good thing that you can always arm yourself with is a pair of tweezers and a buck of a little bucket of soapy water because you can use your tweezers and you can pick like tomato hornworms and you drop them in the soapy water or some other pests and you drop them in the soapy water and they sink and it's uh, it's um, considered a humane way to disp dispose of pest. So that's mechanical controls. Um, other things that you can do is like, say you're following cultural controls, say you're following mechanical controls. Your next one is what we say is biological controls. So biological controls is we're trying to use our environment to our advantage to help maintain and control, maintain and control pest. So um, that's where we start to talk about some of our different types of pesticides or organic pesticides, insecticides. Um, one of the big ones, um, you know, that we use as a biological control is, um, is called BT. And you can see that on the slide, Bacillus thuringiensis. Um, it's a, just a natural bacteria that you can spray on your plants and it attacks soft body insects. Um, so usually in the vegetable garden, that means you have a tornado hornworm or some other types of uh, bean leaf rollers that are causing some issues to your garden. And that's, that's a safe uh, pesticide that you can use to control um, the, the pest within your garden. So um, then you can start to move into, you know, all, another biological controls you can bring in or try to bring in some beneficial insects like ladybugs help control aphids. There's some lace wings that help control. So there's a bunch of other like small pests that predate on, or sorry, there's smaller insects that predate on the pest within our vegetable garden. And that can vary based off of what you have available. Um, a great example of a biological control that we use regularly is for the air potato vine. We have air potato vine beetle that's been released to help munch on that and control that population. So that's a good example of a biological control. So say you go through your uh, cultural, your mechanical, your biological controls, your last method would be the uh, the, the chemical control. That's that last ditch effort. You go through everything um, and nothing is working. So you have your safer insecticides uh, versus your, your more higher um, the chemicals or synthetic chemicals that you're purchasing from the store that can be that are for use for pest, pesticides. Um, so usually for backyard, backyard gardeners, I always recommend leaning on the safer side of that. Um, and some of those include insecticidal soaps, horticulture oils like neem oil, um, because those are, they're not necessarily organic per se, the neem oil is, um, but they're not always necessarily organic, but they're much safer compared to some of the synthetic chemicals that you can uh, get. So, um, so that's, those are the different ways that we can control. Um, that's what we refer as the four methods of IPM or the integrated pest management is cultural, uh, mechanical, biological, and that chemical. So if you, the ideally is if you work through all of those and you're following best management practices, very small chance that you're going to have to end up using your chemical controls. But where do we start from that? We always talk about start scouting regularly, treat early. If you find a population early before it gets bad, it's much, much easier to control, much, much easier to control. Um, 
Additionally is rotate plants. If you rotate plants, never plant plants in the same spot because that's going to actually attract pests, especially nematodes, which will be something that um, we're going to talk about here short, shortly. Um, and rotating plants is going to be very, very beneficial for you. Um, some questions that popped up relating to pesticides or insecticides is where can you buy like insecticidal soaps, neem oil, uh, even the copper fungicide that I mentioned earlier and BT. You can get these all at like your big box stores um, as well as like um, the feed and seed stores around town. They all have them within the garden area. So these are actually all pretty easy to find. And um, one person put in a comment talking about marigolds. So we'll talk a little bit about marigolds here in a second. But what I want to quiz you on about is, so we talked about pests. Um, what are some, like, if we think about all the insects that exist within the world, not population, but let's talk about species. How many, what percentage of the species of insects do we think, or do you think, is considered a pest? Go ahead and put that in the chat box. One person put 10%, 35%, 75% are considered pests, 20? Well, just so you all know, ooh, someone got really close. So um, we're actually, so we've had the 20, we had 10%, 35, 75, 20, 5%, 2%, and oh, someone just nailed it. 1%, only 1%. And we say 1%, it's like roughly 1%. And that's because we're rounding up to 1%. But roughly 1% of the insect species, we actually consider pests. Uh, the rest are beneficial or they directly beneficial to us or the rest, they're not necessarily beneficial nor considered pests. So 1%. So we do a lot in our landscapes for 1% of species. So that's why it's really important that we follow that integrated pest management program because we're protecting the beneficials. The beneficials that work for us, we call those ecosystem services or the benefits that we derive from natural processes. So a pest predating on a, or an insect predating on a pest. So great. So 1%. So always think about that when you're managing a garden. Wait a minute. Only 1% of the pests that I'm managing for, that I can't manage for, are considered pests, or the insects I can manage for are considered pests. So it's important to think about. So one of the things I mentioned about marigolds are nematodes. This is why it's important that we rotate our gardens, rotate our plants, because if we keep them in this, our plants, a specific plant material, like never put your tomato in the same little spot over and over. Move it to another side of your garden and rotate plants around on like a two year, three year cycle. Um, because what happens is nematodes, they're little microscopic worms that kind of work their way in. They're always, they're always in the soil, but there's some really bad nematodes that we don't like. And one of them is called a root knot nematode. And that picture that you can see at the bottom of the screen, you see all those little nodules and bumpy things that exist on that, that's caused from a nematode and it destroys a plant. And what happens is once a nematode, a root knot nematode is in that soil, that soil is pretty much kaputzed until you do, until you completely replace it or you do a solarization. So they're microscopic. You can't see them. We do have tests that you can do for nematodes um, to see kind of if they're, if they are there or what the density of them, how many are there in there, but you know, rotate your plants. You're going to keep your garden safe. But another good strategy is interplant marigolds. There's a certain type of marigold called a, a nimagon uh, marigold. And it's kind of, it's like there's a really good signs that it's very beneficial that if you interplant marigolds in your garden, it deters root knot nematodes. So that's why you see a lot of marigolds in some gardens is because you can interplant those and it can help protect the soil. But more importantly is the solarization. That is a great way to essentially you're cooking the soil to kill off the nematodes. Our big ag, consu ag consumers do this, or producers do this, um, and our backyard gardeners do this. We do this at the extension office. Um, and um, 
what we do is essentially, and you can see in the image on the bottom left, um, you can see a man rolling out plastic over his garden. That's essentially what he's doing is you're rolling out plastic, you're sealing it, it has to be a clear plastic. And what it does, it acts like a little greenhouse and it cooks the soil. So we see a lot of gardening, gardeners do this during our summertime of the period because that's our least productive, at least for vegetable gardens. We have our heat and uh, so you can just solarize your gardens on an annual basis if you want to and it can help control your nematode population. So, um, and someone did put in a comment that Tri Miracles last year didn't have any luck keeping them away. Um, it can depend, uh, it is recommended that there's specific cultivars of marigolds that do well for helping keep away um, the nematodes. And that's that Nemagon is one of those uh, marigolds. So, oh, and I had a question pop in is what do I mean by inner plant? So you have your vegetable garden all laid out and you just kind of put marigolds in some of the open spaces that you have within your vegetable garden. So pathogens. So pathogens, um, this is really comes back to the, the fungus or different types of uh, bacteria or viruses that can come in. And this is something we already talked about a little bit. Avoid overhead irrigation and watering uh, because that minimizes the amount of water that ends up on the leaves of all your plant material. Water in the early morning to make sure that to allow excess of water to kind of evaporate off of the plant material. But if you do notice that you're having some diseased plants pop up or some fungus pop up, sanitation is going to be very important. So make sure that every time you touch a plant that has infected, wash your hands, keep them nice and clean so you don't spread that fungus or disease. Um, as well as if you're using any tools or implements, you, tools or other gardening uh, implements, make sure you clean those as well to prevent from spreading. But you can always just pinch off some of the infected leaves to keep the funguses from spreading. Um, and what you can do is you can pinch them off, throw them away in the normal, normal garbage, do not put them in compost. That's gonna be very important. Um, and then most fungicides are gonna be very good protectants like a copper fungicide or a neem oil can be very beneficial in helping keep uh, at least fungus at bay within your garden. So then harvesting, that's when you start to get to the yummy part. Um, the best way to indicate like when are you going to harvest is think about what would it look like if you're going to purchase it within the garden or purchase it at the store. Harvest when it looks like you'd purchase it. Don't wait too long though. Um, but then once you harvest the plants, feel free to add compost, replace new plants, and then always track where your plants are going to be. Um, an important thing to know, you can see in the foreground of the picture on this image, you see a little flower kind of shooting up, has a little bit of yellow on it. Um, that is a leafy green. If you don't harvest your leafy greens in time, you can start at the bottom of the leafy greens and it'll keep growing. But if you don't harvest the leafy greens, it's going to bolt. The bolt is when it creates the flower and seeds and it'll be done producing for the year. So if you're har as long as you're harvesting the greens off of those leafy greens, it won't bolt. But uh, sometimes when you start to getting to through that harvest season that you would like to harvest those greens, you let it bolt. So then you can collect the seeds and you have a good seed uh, collection for your next year. So yeah, like I mentioned, harvest when things look like you'd eat them. So coming back to the essential questions, you know, we talked about, hopefully since everything that we've talked about, um, you can answer these three questions. How do I plan and design my vegetable garden? What are common vegetables and fruits to grow here in Alachua County? And then how do I manage my garden? So those are the three big questions that I want us to be able to talk about, or be able to answer. Um, so as we finish out, feel free to reach out to me at any time with your questions or comments. Um, you can email me directly at tclem at alachuacounty.us or we also have uh, the Master Gardener Help Desk where we have Master Gardener volunteers available to help answer questions. Um, that email is mag at alachuacounty.com. So feel free um, to, if there's any questions that you have, uh, feel free to write them in the uh, chat box or the, the question uh, section so I can uh, address those before we end up closing our time together today.
and I do have um, a survey that I would like everyone to fill out. Um, let me get that link for you all. It's going to be in the chat box and um, it's just a qu online Qualtrics survey. I do this as a great way to, um, excuse me, this is a great way to track the programs and see how well they're doing. Um, but in the chat box, feel free to fill out that uh, survey and I'll send it again. Um, and I will make these slides available. Yeah, I'll go ahead and I'll make these slides available. I'll forward these to the office to make sure that they can be distributed amongst all the participants that are here today. Thank you. So um, question, one of the questions is when to harvest sweet potatoes. Sweet potatoes can be hard to determine because you're not seeing, um, you're not seeing them grow like the others since they're all underneath the ground. Usually you're gonna have to wait uh, quite a bit for them. They can take between 90 to 120 days to, um, to, to grow. Um, so usually when you, if you wait that at least that minimum 90 days period, you're gonna see that you're gonna have a lot of production that, have, that has occurred under the soil. Um, and you'll be able to pull up quite a bit from that. So it's just gonna be more time-based versus um, visual determination. Um, but if you notice that it's grown a lot and it's taking over a big space, that means it's doing very successful on our ground and you could probably uh, harvest it or cut it back some. So this, um, this recording will be, one of the questions was, will this recording be available? Yes, it will be. Um, Alachua County Extension, we do have a YouTube channel uh, available. Um, let me put that link. Feel free to follow our page um, so you can uh, get up to date um, content as we release it. But I'll put a recording of this presentation um, on there for you all so you can uh, watch it another time. So one question is, do potted plants need to be outside the lanai or can they stay inside the cage? So um, if, you, if, if you have plants, you're doing container garden, you can definitely keep them inside of a lanai as long as they're getting enough sunlight and you can get water to them. And sometimes a really nice thing about having that lanai or some of your plants on a lanai is the fact that that screen is creating a nice protective barrier around your what you're growing. So it actually reduces the risk of having pests and other uh, annoyances come into your garden and causing destruction. So yeah, you can definitely keep them in the lanai as long as they're getting enough sunlight and they have moisture that can get available to them. Great question. So uh, one question is, I live in an apartment and wanted to do container gardening, but my patio faces north. Is there any hope for me planting a small garden? So that's really tough because there's not many fruits and vegetables that um, you can grow in shade conditions like that. Um, you could probably do some herbs um, like dill, rosemary, maybe able to get some, um, but it's going to be really tough. But um, in situations like that, uh, feel free to reach out to me directly for more instructions on this. But you can actually do uh, productive mushroom growing at the house. So you can do like pink and yellow and white oyster mushrooms, lion's mane. There's a whole slew of different types of mushrooms that you can grow at a house very, very easily that are delicious and tasty and great to bring right into a kitchen. Um, my family, we, um, we lived in a townhome for a while and we didn't have access to a good place to really grow any gardens. Um, but we were growing lion's mane mushroom and uh, different types of oyster mushrooms, shiitake mushrooms um, in our home. So, oh, I see that none of the links that I sent have followed through. I apologize. There's one and I, I know exactly how it happened too. The one that just went through that was uh, the YouTube channel. And then here's the Qualtrics link. I apologize. I had my chat box set up to only go to other panelists. But feel free to follow us on the YouTube page um, as well as uh, fill out that um, 
that survey for us. And if you are interested, um, we started a, a podcast recently within our extension office. And one of the podcast episodes that we do have has to do with summer vegetable gardening. So that's always a really cool way to um, just listen for more information. The podcast is called Extension Cord, um, and you can find it on Spotify, Apple, Google. Um, it's on all those major carriers. Um, I just put our general link on into the chat box if you want to go in there and check it out and listen to it. But um, thank you, everybody, for jo uh, joining in today. Um, I really appreciate this opportunity. Hopefully that you all are excited to ready to go out and turn some dirt uh, build a build a bed in your backyard and start planting and growing. But I think one of the most important things is to always know that gardening's gardening is fun. It's incredibly enjoyable. It can be frustrating and difficult at some times. You will fail. I fail all the times at some of the stuff I'm growing. But the most important thing is you learn so much more from those failures in gardening than you do from succeeding. So don't feel discouraged. Always look out at UFIFS Extension Alachua County as a resource for you uh, because we love to make sure that you can be successful by giving you the best resources, the best science-based resources um, to your fingertips and to you so you can be as successful as possible. Um, thank you all very, very much. I'm sorry that we have to meet in like a webinar forum because I love being able to have these programs talking with one another face-to-face, -face, but um, I'm glad that we were able to schedule this and that we were able to still meet and still make this available to you all. Thank you all very, very much.